Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming. And today I'm going to talk to you about vectorization and how you can use it to improve the performance of your code. So I'm going to start by giving a motivation of why you want to use vectorization. Then I'll go into what the concept of vectorization is. And I'll follow it up with a simple, simple example. And then I'll go through ways to improve the vectorization efficiency of your code once you've got your uh, code to vectorize in the first place. And then I'll finish with a few analysis tools available that you can use to um, profile your code and get some vectorization metrics. Okay, so we are reaching the, the end of Moore's law. Uh, all that Moore's law states is roughly every two years, the, the number of transistors on a CPU will double and hence the clock rate of the CPU will increase. So you'll get performance increases from your code without having to, to change it at all. But what we're seeing is uh, this start to end. So you'll see clock rates peaking and the way that vendors, manufacturers have been keeping the performance of the CPU uh, high and to, to keep increasing is by way of increasing the parallelism on the chip. So the number of cores per chip is increasing. So just as an example for this, the latest AMD Epic chips for Gamo can have up to 128 cores, which is a huge number of cores to have on a single chip. In order for you to uh, get the most out of these modern CPUs and to get anywhere near the, the peak theoretical performance, you need to parallelize your code. Uh, and on top of this, so on top of using MPI, OpenMP, for example, you also need to make use of the the SIMD vector units inside these CPUs. This is an added layer of uh, performance improvement that you can that you can use. So the the older CPUs um, can provide up to eight times improvement to your code with the AVX and AVX two instruction sets. Uh, but the the more modern ones all have the the AVX five twelve. Uh, instruction sets, which you can get up to 16 times performance. This is on the Intel CPUs. I think AMD are moving to longer widths, but I'm, I'm focusing mainly on the Intel CPUs in this talk. So it's, it's, it's worthwhile looking at your code to see if you can benefit from vectorization. Okay, so what is vectorization? So single instruction, multiple data. This is what SIMD stands for. What it allows us to do is, so take an add, subtract, multiply, divide, for example. It allows you to, you, to do this multiple, it, it allows you to do this single operation on multiple data all at the same time. So if you're not using vectorization, you'll be using scalar instructions on the CPU. So what would take eight scalar instructions now can be done with one vector instruction if we take AVX uh, instruction set, for example. And this can result in a, an eight times improvement to the speed of the code. So it's well worth looking into. So for example, say we want to add two, two arrays together, A and B to produce C. If you didn't use vectorization, you just use scalar operations, you would have to do each individual add, so that's four operations. Whereas if you're using, uh, so if we take the SSE instruction set, which is one of the older uh, vector instruction sets, it only has a vector length of four. We can do all of this, all of these four operations in one vector instruction, resulting in an improvement to performance of four. So this is essentially uh, vectorization. So I've talked about a few different vector instruction sets. They are broken down into different vector lengths. 
So on a CPU, we have a series of registers and we have these specialized vector registers is what they're called. So on SSE, they are 128 bit registers. So what this means is if you are working with data, which is uh, 32 bit, so four bytes, for example, you can store four data elements in this 128-bit vector register. And then if you go to AVX, AVX2, you can store up to eight. This is single precision data. And then finally, AVX512, you can store up to 16 single precision uh, data elements and perform uh, vector operations on them. You can also do the same with uh, double precision data, so 64-bit doubles, for example, but you'll just, you'll only see an improvement of performance of eight on AVX512 as they take up more space in the register. So let's look at a, a simple example of adding uh, two arrays together and how we can vectorize it. Are there any questions so far before I continue? Okay, I'll, I'll go on with the example. So imagine, as I said previously, we want to add two arrays together, A and B, and we want to use a, uh, a float data type. So we want to use 32-bit, and then we store the result in C. Oh, we have a question. Will the slides be available? After? Yes. I'll post them on the, uh, the Sina Education website after the talk. So we want to add two arrays together and we're using SC uh, vector length just for the example. We initialize them with values. Um, just we'll set the index high is equal to each element of A. And we'll just add one to the uh, the B elements. And then once we've performed the operation, once we've initialized the values, then we'll perform the, the addition itself. So we're just adding the two elements together and storing the result in C. And I've made the, uh, the vector length four, and I've made sure to uh, make sure that the arrays are also the same length as the vector. But this can be, what I tend to do is this can be any multiple of the vector length just to keep the, the for loops uh, when it vectorizes to, it, it equals a multiple of the vector length. So it makes it easier to vectorize and improves the performance. So we've written our source code. Now we want to compile it. Now, if you use the compiler to auto vectorize the code, which is what we call uh, a process whereby the compiler unrolls the for loop and generates a set of vector instructions in its place. In order to do this, we need to specify certain flags to perform the auto vectorization. So on, if you're using the Intel compiler, ICC, what you want to use, even if you, not vectorizing, what you should always use is the X host flag, because what this will do is it'll take the highest available instruction set on the machine and it'll apply those optimizations to your code. And in addition to this, you'll want to add the, the O2 flag. The O2 flag is what is the level of uh, that the Intel compiler requires to perform vectorization, perform auto vectorization. The same can be said for the GNU compiler. Instead of Xhost, you'll use Arch Native, and it vectorizes at a O3 level or with the, the F3 vectorize flag. So once we've compiled our code with uh, vect auto vectorization, then we want to run it. So this is just the difference between the scalar instructions and the vector instructions. So as you can see, if you did it without vectorization, 
this represents the full uh, vector register, but we're not using vectorization. So each individual element can be loaded once into the, the scalar register on the CPU, and that'll be added, A will be added to B and then stored in C. But as you can see, all of this extra register space is not being used, so it's not being utilized. But then if you look onto the, so you'll have to do this four separate times. So you'll have to load each element of the array into the register. So load A and load B, then perform the operation and then store the result in C. Whereas on the vectorization instructions, we can load all elements at once for A and B, and then perform the add operation in one instruction and store the result in a uh, result into C. This is essentially uh, vectorization in a nutshell. So are there any questions so far? I have some questions in the chat. How do you find out the size of vectors supported by your architecture? So what you can do is, what I tend to do is either look up the CPU online or you can use the, uh, the proc. You can do cat slash proc slash CPU info and it'll give you a list of the instruction set available on, the, on that machine. And it'll give you the ID of the, the CPU. Yes, yeah, thanks, Mark. Okay, I'll, I'll continue now. Okay, so I'm going to go through some uh, traps that you might fall into with vectorization. So not, not all loops are suitable for vectorization. There are a few cases where it'll prove difficult for the compiler to, to vectorize the code. But then also, even if the compiler can vectorize your code, it might not be more efficient than the scalar instructions. So the vectorizer, the compiler might choose not to vectorize the code. And then other loops may not vectorize at all due to some dependencies. And I'm just going to go through each case next. So loop dependencies is the big one. So what a loop dependency is, is when one iteration of a loop depends on another iteration of the loop. And as we've seen in the example, each operation happens at the same time in the, the four element array. So you can't, you can't depend, you can't have a dependency between one element and the other. So for example, if we have this kind of loop, the loop in over each, uh, element of A and B, but the ith, the ith uh, element of A is dependent on the, the, the I minus one element. You can't do this with vectorization because it's this is being calculated at the same time as I. If you see in, in, in vectorization land, so if we're talking about ABX, so we're doing eight iterations at the same time. There's no way for AI minus one to be known before the ith iteration. And this dependency, this specific dependency is known as a read after write dependency, where one variable is written in, in one iteration and read in a subsequent iteration. So after loop dependencies, the main reason why vectorization doesn't go ahead by the compiler is memory access patterns. It's very sensitive to memory access patterns. And I'm going to go through three types of memory access patterns. We have unit stride, constant stride, and random access. So let's go through each case now. So unit stride is when the data is loaded from a point in memory, which is contiguous. So this is when the elements of AI are all uh, 
consecutively loaded from memory. This gives the best performance due to vectorization because it's the simplest memory access pattern uh, when it comes to, for the compiler. So for example, you will have, so this is the array A here, this is all of, it, all of its elements. And as you, for each iteration of the loop, you're just loading the next one in the array. The, so YMM is the name of the vector register when you're using AVX instructions. So this represents the vector on the CPU, the vector register. So as you can see, you can just do one contiguous load from A into the YMM register. Uh, and it's much, it's much more efficient than any other access pattern. So if you can try and modify your loops to have a, a unit stride memory access pattern. And the next pattern is constant stride. So this is when data is loaded from a fixed offset in memory. So if you look at this example, we have A and B again, but instead of doing it contiguous in memory, we have a constant offset. So we, we are loading every third element from memory into the vector register. This is still possible with vectorization, but it has a, a lower performance than the unit stride, which I went through previously. So this is when you have the array, and instead of loading all of the elements of A, you are loading every third element into this vector register. As you can see, it's a constant stride. So the, the compiler can predict, it knows, it needs to skip over these elements and then load them into a packed uh, vector register here. But it's just a little bit more complicated than the unit stride. So just bear that in mind. Now the final memory access pattern is the random access. So this is when the data is loaded unpredictably from memory into the vector register. So if you look at this example, instead of indexing A directly just with the, the, the loop index here, you'll use a secondary array, which would be loading the, the uh, array with uh, elements you've previously you populated. So it's not easy for the compiler to know what exactly is being loaded into the vector. So it's hard for it to, to optimize the memory load. So it'll be, it'll be known at runtime versus compile time. So this would be the poorest vectorization performance as, as a comp the compiler is, is quite, um, it's quite good at optimization, but it, it, it can't know if this is at runtime, how to, to optimize this memory access. So always, please always try to avoid this access pattern if at all possible. Even if it's, you can define what this index array is statically. So before runtime, you can do it uh, and I'll allow the compiler to optimize the memory loads. So this is, yeah, so we have A and imagine uh, this is the, the index array. So you'll have, you load the first element, then you'll load Miss out the second or the third, and then there might be a, a gap of three or four elements, and then you look. It's 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 completely unpredictable for the the compiler to know. So remember, unit stride is the best. Constant stride is the second best, and third third best is the the random access. If at all possible, avoid this. So one way to improve the memory access patterns of your code is to use what is known as a structure of arrays. So typically in codes, you'll find this kind of structure when you store. So if you take particle positions, for example, you'll store a position structure with X, Y, and Z, and then you'll create an array of these structures what is known as a, an array of structures. But as you can see in memory, this array of structures has X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, 
if you're loading only the the x part of the particle's positions, you'll have what's known as a, a constant stride in memory axis, as I went through. And the same for, for y and z, if you're only loading, loading the y and the z components of, the, of this array of structures. This is not the best for vectorization. So what we can use is what's called the structure of arrays. So instead of storing your particle positions like this, we can store a structure which contains the arrays themselves. So you'll create an array of X positions, uh, Y positions, and Z positions. And then when you declare, you just you declare the whole structure like this. So what this will do is it'll change the memory access patterns from an array of structures to a structure of arrays. So you'll go from a a constant stride in memory access to a unit stride as all the X positions are contiguous in memory versus before they were a constant stride in memory. So this is one way to improve your memory access patterns. And it still uses the same, the same amount of memory. It just aids in vectorization. So if you can, if you can make use of this structure, for vectorization, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Okay, is there any questions so far? That doesn't look like there's any more in the chat. Okay, I'll continue. So another uh, issue it can be a problem in, vect in vectorization is if your loop contains a branch. So say for example, you only want to add every other element of A and B together and store it in C. You just have a, an if statement here. What this, what the compiler will try to do is it might, it might not vectorize the loop at all, but it will attempt to use a what's known as a, a logical mask for this conditional statement. And it'll perform all additions in the array. And then what it'll do is it'll create the mask and it'll apply the mask to the result. So the, you'll still only get the, uh, the even indexed elements from the result, but it'll just perform all the operations rather than the, just the specific ones you want. Yeah, so even if it does succeed in vectorizing the loop, it might be less efficient than using the, then and then a loop which doesn't contain a, a conditional statement like this. What you can try to do is, is remove the conditional statement into like prior to the loop and only have the most uh, compute intensive parts in the in the vectorized loops because that's what uh, the compiler likes uh, when performing vectorization. Another strategy is even even if you're not looking at vectorization, when you are loading data to and from memory addresses, CPUs always prefer memory addresses which are aligned on a specific byte boundary in, in RAM as opposed to an unaligned memory address. So for example, AVX 512 instructions always prefer data which is aligned on a 64 byte memory uh, in, in RAM as it's more efficient for the, the memory operations to retrieve the data from RAM. So in order to, to tell the compiler to align data, we can use uh, what's called uh, an attribute, the compiler, and we can give it uh, a number. So this is the, the byte boundary that we want the, the data to be aligned to. So as you can see, we declare arrays as before, but now we use this, this attribute uh, parameter here and pass the aligned Hint to the compiler, which will mean which will mean 
This data is now aligned on a 64 byte boundary in memory. So we've declared the array, but now when it comes to the, the vectorized loop itself, we need to give a further hint to the compiler just to make sure that it knows that the data is aligned. I know in, in this case, it's it's straight after the arrays have been declared, but in uh, in other applications and in, in, in larger applications, the declaration might be in another file. It might be uh, far removed from the actual loop. So it's still good practice to, to use this hint directly on the loop. So you can use this the hint called the sum aligned. That just you can so it's just essentially tell the compiler assume that this array is aligned on a sixty four byte boundary when you're performing uh, memory loads from memory into the vector registers, and you can do that for B and C as well. So in B will be a, a memory load into the vector register, whereas this assume aligned for C will be a memory store into the vector register. Are there any questions before I move on? I'll just check the chat. Yeah, there's some questions. So from Gerald, it seems like there should be a way to transform EOS code to SOA. Don't compilers do that? I know. So the, the compiler won't do that automatically. You can you have to specify the, the structure of array uh, yourself and then convert it in the code. So you could have it uh, globally as an array of structures, but prior to the vectorized loop, you can try converting it to a structure of arrays and see if you get better performance for the loop. If you don't want to have to edit the entirety of the code to use a structure of arrays. So there's another question from Noah. For large arrays, we want to perform vector operations on, is there an optimal way to pad our vector to prevent false sharing between calls? Uh, so, so up to this point, I've just assumed this is this is single threaded, uh, but you will you will need to, uh, yeah, ensure that your code is safe uh, cross threads. Uh, I don't know of a way to explicitly so that you have to pad vectors uh, if they don't if they're not a multiple of the vector length. Because this, all, I'm not going to go through in this talk, but that will improve the performance of the vectorization if your vector arrays are a multiple of the vector line. But you will, yeah, you'll need to make sure that there's a uh, that a safe between threads when you perform the vectorization. But that's the same with scalar code as well. There's another question. Add Gavai. Sorry if I'm. I'm butchering your name. Is there a way to align memory dynamically for say 3D arrays? Yes, there is. There should be, uh, if you're using uh, pointers to, uh, to declare your arrays, there should be a way to do that. I I'm not, I'm not gonna go through that in this talk, but if you if you want further uh, help, there's, a, there's an email at the end of the talk and you can just email us uh, at support at sign it and I'll get back to you. So there's another question from Pavel. Would alignment only matter for start and end of array? I how much performance difference does it make? I'm not actually sure about that. I think because if you if you if you're off alignment at the start, all subsequent stores or loads will be off alignment. So I'm I think it might affect the whole the whole of the array. But would it make, let's say, a factor of two difference or a factor of 16 difference? That's what I'm wondering. Oh, right, that big. I, I, yeah, I don't think it's that big of a difference because it, it can still deal with unaligned loads and stores. Yeah, if you look at the, uh, com if you generate assembler from your compiler and you look at the code and you didn't make 
ensure it's properly aligned, you'll find there's a lot of extra code. The compiler will say, well, if it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, until it can get to an aligned portion, then it will do that. So this adds a lot of code bloat to your code and could affect maybe some efficiency. However, if you're doing a hundred million integers, I suppose you're not going, or floats or whatever, you're not going to see much of a difference uh, because you have so many. But if in shorter sequences, you're going to have these misaligned requests. So those will be uh, a larger percentage of the time and therefore a little bit less efficient. So if you can set the alignment correctly to begin with, then you should. Thanks. And then the compiler doesn't generate a whole bunch of code saying, oh, well, if the address it offset the alignment is this and that and this and that. Uh, and the if you looked at the assembler, you would say, oh, that's all it's doing. It's the code, but then there's jumps and all that. And then you lose some of your instruction cache hits, cache hits and stuff like that. Thanks, Paul. OK, I think I'm getting through all the questions. I didn't realize some of them had already been answered. OK, I'll continue. Um, OK, so in addition to these hints, we have what is called a vectorization pragmas. So if if the compiler thinks a loop shouldn't vectorize for either a loop dependency or whether it thinks scalar instructions are faster than vector instructions, you can override what the compiler thinks and force it to vectorize. So the compiler, if it if it finds a loop dependency, it just won't vectorize. You can use this pragma IV depth. So essentially ignore any vector dependencies. So this is if you know uh, absolutely like completely that this dependency is not a true dependency and the compiler will then vectorize a loop. But make sure because if there's an actual dependency, you'll get the wrong, you'll get the wrong result. So only use this in extreme cases when you know there's no dependency there. So what the compiler will do is it'll it'll generate a series of uh, estimates or metrics on the cost of the loop. So it'll, it'll estimate the cost of the loop with scalar instructions and with vector instructions. And if the scalar instructions uh, it thinks are going to outperform the vector instructions, it won't vectorize the loop. But if you if you want to, what I what I would recommend is if you want to essentially test the compiler. You want to check to see if it's got its estimates correct. You can use the the pragma vector always, and it tells the compiler to vectorize the loop. It takes into account dependencies, so if there are any dependencies there, it won't vectorize. But it tells it mainly to ignore the cost metrics that it's calculated, and and it forces it to to vectorize the code. But yeah, essentially you just add these to the, the line before the for loop and then compile, take them into account when it's analyzing the code. Okay, so that's that's all uh, the optimizations I'll go through today and the, the pragmas and the hints that you can give to the compiler. Uh, the tools now that you can use to aid in profiling your code uh, is what's called an, an optimization report. So each compiler will, uh, will provide this and it gives you a report showing the vectorization eligibility and the, the estimated vectorization efficiency of each loop. It's essentially what it uses to determine whether the loop should be vectorized or not. If you're using the Intel compiler, you can use this QOpt report flag. Uh, and if you set this to five, it'll give you all optimizations, uh, including uh, vectorization optimizations. And there's another flag for GNU, this, this opt info ec all, and then you specify the, the output file of the report. So this is, this is the, the optimization report generated when I compiled with the 
opt report flag on the, the add.c example. I'm just going to go through each line of this report. So it'll, it'll give you, so this is the main loop, the addition loop. And it tells you on which line. And as you can see, uh, so I, I, I slightly modified the code to put the assume aligned the hints. And I made sure that the arrays were aligned on a, a 64 byte boundary. And as you can see, uh, the report uh, shows this. So each array has an aligned access. So it'll generate uh, aligned instructions versus unaligned instructions. It'll look at the, the highest level vector length on the system uh, and it'll use the um, use that to vectorize the, the code. So as you can see, it's it's chosen to use uh, AVX instructions. And this is just stating that the, the whole loop was completely unrolled. And yes, that the loop was actually vectorized versus an unsuccessful uh, attempt. Yeah, so we'll all, also the compiler, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll says that it's chosen to use the AVX instructions over the AVX 512 vector registers. But what you can do is you can override the compiler and use this flag, which is called uh, QOPT ZMM usage high. So you can sort of vary uh, how much of the, the AVX 512 instructions are used over the AVX instructions. I have a, a couple more slides on that later on, so just uh, bear that in mind. Uh, as you can see, it also gives the memory access pattern. So uh, you can see there's no conditional statement. So there's no masking. So it's unmasked, it's aligned, and it's unit stride in memory. So these are all the ones, these are all the, the terms that you want when you're rectorizing your code to get the best efficiency. So it's unit stride access in memory. So there's two loads. So this is just A and B, and the store is C. And then this just summarizes what it thinks the, the scalar cost would be versus the vectorization cost. And then I think it just divides these and it, it gives a rough estimate of the speed up of the loop. Um, but yeah, take this with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean you're going to get 9.6 times faster in your code. You'll need to profile your code and uh, test it for yourself. So that's the optimization reports. Intel also provides a tool called Intel Advisor. Intel Advisor is like a, a graphical user interface, uh, which prof profiles the code and records the metrics. So it's just a better way of looking at, at the code than just with the optimization reports. But it's great for analyzing the efficiency of your code. It provides yeah, lots of useful uh, hints and tips um, in order to improve the the efficiency. There's a good tutorial here that I've linked in the slide, uh, and it looks something like this. So I'll give a summary of, of your code, uh, each loop and how many loops were vectorized. It'll give a time in the vectorized loops versus the scalar time, uh, and look at the total time. And it'll show you which vector instructions were used. And then this, this Note here is there's a higher instruction set available on the hardware, but the loops haven't been vectorized with it. And I'm guessing this will then tell you to use the, the ZMM uh, optimization flag, and you can set that to high, and then you'll use the highest instruction set available. And then you can actually go into the source code, go into the loops, and look. Uh, at a finer granularity. So you can go on a loop-to-loop -loop basis and it'll give you reasons of why it's not performing uh, at the best level of efficiency. And it'll give you uh, access to yeah, the vector length used, the efficiencies on using SSE, and it'll give you a whole lot of traits of the loop. You can do a, a more in-depth memory access and it'll, and it'll tell you whether you're using unit stride, constant stride, or random access in memory. And you can use this as a, as a, a better tool to analyze your code.
that's available on on the alliance on, on the alliance systems as well if you want to use that that tool now finally so this so i've already gone through auto vectorization in the code this is when you only edit your code very um you only do a few edits to the code if you want to get the best performance out of the code you can use what's called uh, vector intrinsics because so auto vectorization is quick uh, you don't have to do much um but it might not give the best performance it depends on how, how good the compiler is if you use uh, vector intrinsics these operate directly on the vector registers and you do this in the source code and you can get the, one of the best performance with vector intrinsics however it it drastically lowers the portability of the code so if you generate a list of intrinsics uh, and one system you'll have to generate uh, a new set of intrinsics on another system it all depends on which uh, architecture you're running the code on there's a good guide, uh, the Intel Intrinsics Guide, which lists all the intrinsics, vector intrinsics available uh, to, to edit your code. But just as an example, this is the same edition example that I went through earlier, but it's using intrinsics. So it's a lot, it's a lot harder to understand uh, what's actually going on with intrinsics, but essentially, you have the vectors a and b and you're loading from the array a and b into the vector register and then you perform the the addition operation between the two vectors a and b and then you restore the result back onto the onto the c array it's if you want to like highly optimize your code uh, you could look into this but uh, if you want to run as many machines as possible, I would stick to the auto vectorization as this is not it's not very portable. So how long have we got left? We have 15 minutes. Okay, I can go through this. So there's a there's a caveat to, to this vectorization. The CPUs, unless the, the Intel CPUs definitely. When they use AVX five twelve instructions, they will they may downclock all of the cores running on the CPU. Now this is because these some some of these AVX five twelve instructions draw more power from the CPU. So in order to keep the same same power usage, uh, the CPU will actually downclock some cores or all cores on the CPU. So. For example, taking this Intel Xeon Gold CPU, this is how the, the CPU frequency behaves as you use in each uh, instruction set. So if we're using no vector instructions, as you increase the number of cores, the, the frequency goes down slight, slightly. But as you go on to AVX, AVX2, it lowers a little bit further, but then AVX five twelve. If you're hitting four cores to five cores, there's a there's a quite a large jump in the clock frequency on the CPU. So what I'd recommend is for you to benchmark your code with and without vectorization, along with uh, using AVX instructions uh, and comparing it to AVX five twelve instructions, because this. This can seriously hamper the performance of your code. So it's it's well worth looking into. So yeah, so benchmark your code with AVX AVX2 and compare to AVX512. When you look in to, to decide which uh, vector instruction set to use. So to compile with a specific vector instruction set, you can use these flags here. So dash X AVX for AVX and then CoreVX2 for AVX2 and AVX512 if you want to try this out. Yeah, please bear this in mind when you're running with vectorization enabled. I think I'm just 
I'm nearly finished. So I'm, I'm just going to summarize. So vectorization is can be very valuable and you can prove your performance if you go up to 16 times. You can use uh, the compiler's auto vectorizer to vectorize your loops. Uh, and the main, the main reasons behind either no, no vectorization or lower vectorization efficiency is the, the memory access patterns, aligning data on 64 byte boundaries, and you can also make use of a structure of arrays versus an array of structures in your code. And we've gone through a few tools to analyze the performance of the code uh, with uh, Intel Advisor and the optimizer, optimization reports provided by the compilers. And I found a good uh, intro to vectorization and I've linked it here. And if you have any uh, questions on vectorization, please uh, feel free to email uh, sign at support and I'll be happy to help you out. But yeah, thank you.